Good morning and welcome you all to this session on Ukraine and India's great power relations. You may wonder why we have decided to dedicate an India-China luncheon lecture series to India's position in Ukraine. The choice of these topics, though, didn't come out purely out of opportunism. I mean, India's position on Ukraine is often misunderstood or even caricatured here in Europe, when in fact, it is apprehended over there in a radically different perspective because it may in reality have little to do with Ukraine, but everything to do with China. Indeed, as written in the invitation, balancing China in Asia is India's highest priorities and Delhi continues to see a role for Moscow in that strategy. This is not, of course, without creating some tensions in India's diplomacy, and it certainly raises some question about the sustainability uh, about, of India's Russia's policy. But in order to discuss that, we need to understand first the determinant of this Russia policy, which is why we have dedicated to dedicate this session to this very topic and examine it through India's own rationale. We could, have, we could have hardly found a better speaker to do so this morning than uh, Dr. Raja Mohan. Most of you know him already. He is a well-known figure and has been speaking all over the world for years. He is currently a senior fellow with the Asia Society Policy Institute in Delhi and a visiting professor at the Institute of South Asian Studies, ISAS, of the National University of Singapore, of which he was the director not so long ago. It was until then, uh, it was earlier, sorry, the funding director of Carnegie India in Delhi, the sixth international center of Carnegie's Endowment for International Peace. Along his long and very distinguished academic career, he was associated with several Indian think tanks, including the Indian Defense Studies and Analysis. He's also been a professor of South Asian Studies at the Jawaharlal Nehru University in New Delhi and the Rajan Ram School of International Studies in Singapore. And he has served, of course, on India's National Security Advisory Board. But last but not least, he certainly is today one of the most influential writers on India's foreign policy and international relations in general. As always, we will have a presentation of about 25 to 30 minutes before moving to the Q&A. And I remind you that you can already start asking questions through the Q&A box if you wish to do so. But uh, let's turn now to our speaker and Raja, the floor is yours. And thank you for your presence this morning. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Frederick, for that uh, generous uh, introduction. Uh, it's uh, delighted to be here uh, with uh, so many of you uh, this afternoon. Uh, meeting in uh, different, joining from different parts of uh, Europe and uh, and Asia. Uh, in fact, uh, the what uh, Frederick said that the last three four years, I mean, much of the world, uh, certainly the West and India, were focused on the China question. But uh, what Putin has done in Ukraine uh, has compelled uh, a the world to turn attention to Europe, of European security, uh, and for us who are really principally focused on uh, China and the uh, Indo-Pacific security, uh, it poses uh, a, a set of problems in how we deal with uh, the, the crisis in Russia, the uh, crisis in Europe. My sense is uh, there is, I mean, among the governments of Europe, uh, uh, many of whom we've seen uh, step up their engagement with India in recent years, uh, there is a sense of unhappiness about uh, India's reluctance to condemn Russia. So I hope uh, in the next uh, few minutes, I mean, I'll be able to at least explain the context uh, in which India's uh, position is uh, and whether you agree or not. I mean, at least hopefully my presentation will help you explain uh, the, the specific and somewhat peculiar situation of India uh, in relation to China, Russia uh, and, the, and the West. But at, at the very outset, I mean, uh, let me say uh, that, uh, that India will remain in spite of what has happened in Europe. Uh, my sense is the Asian question, the Asian security or the Indo-Pacific security is not going to disappear uh, for the United States, for a large number of other countries. I mean, I leave it to you uh, to talk about Europe and Europe, it's Europe's role after the current crisis uh, in, in Asia. So the Asian question is not going to disappear. 
And India is quite central, uh, whichever way you cut it, uh, to the question of a new balance of power system in Asia. And I think India's centrality in that framework does not disappear because there is a European crisis. Uh, there is a problem in Europe in which uh, India's role uh, and consequences of its action are fairly limited. So let me say here, I mean, at the, that India is not your problem in Ukraine. I mean, while, you no, know, for all the unhappiness about India's reluctance to condemn, uh, that it is not India that creates your uh, a, a problem there for you. <coughs> it is actually, compared to the scale of Europe's engagement with Russia, of Germany's engagement with Russia, not just on energy and oil, but but uh, on industry, on the on the uh, you know that the convergences that have emerged between the two of them, German capital, uh, Russian market, uh, German Russia as an export market, uh, as well as uh, Europe's uh, capital uh, taking advantage of that of that market. So so that interdependence uh, is geographic. I'm not passing any judgment on it. I'm not making a political point. So your relationship and what Europe does, what it does to whether strengthen or weaken Russia in this context is far more consequential than what India does. Uh, it's, you know, it's all right for your Germany to you know, join the UN resolution condemning Russia, but German actions or European actions are far more consequential than uh, India's engagement with Russia. So just one figure. Uh, India's total trade uh, with Russia is barely ten billion dollars, uh, so so it is not something uh, significant by by any stretch of imagination. And the relative share of Russia in India's overall trade and its international relations has been on a on a steady decline. Uh, but but uh, Russia does have a, a particular niche uh, in India's uh, defense policies and national security policies. One uh, because of historic reasons. Uh, we've had to be our dependence on Russia uh, for defense supplies has is massive. Uh, in the last few years, we've seen some decline of that. But the size of the India's inventory, it's the third largest armed force in the world. And for 60 years of buying Russian equipment leaves India uh, completely tied to uh, the Russian supplies uh, on, the, uh, on the defense front. And this becomes even more complicated uh, given the fact that India is today uh, caught up in a conflict with China, where uh, thousands of soldiers are face to face uh, up in the Himalayas. Uh, and at this point, uh, India uh, is not going to risk any uh, reduction of supplies or the Russians creating uh, problems. But this also, I think, the good news, if you will, is this crisis might uh, end up actually uh, over the longer term, uh, reducing Russia's salience for India even more over the period of over the period of uh, coming years. But in the interim, the challenge is one of managing the path dependence that India has had built with Russia uh, over, the last, over the last many decades. That brings me to a, a, a second broad point I wanted to mention at the outset, that China, Russia has a role in Asian security. I mean, uh, whether as a neutral, a Russia that stays away from China is tied more to the West, would make it a lot easier to balance uh, balance China and to build a new order uh, in, in Asia. Uh, in fact, many of us were hoping uh, that when Biden's outreach to uh, Putin uh, in June uh, would create the conditions under which US and Russia can work together. Uh, we also bet some on Macron's own position that Russia is an integral part of Europe. Uh, and that Russia must eventually be brought into some kind of a European security architecture. So our position on Russia's role in Asia uh, is similar. I mean, so it is not very different. So therefore, I think that should make it easier to see uh, why India uh, does not want Russia to go full, you know, full tilt uh, towards a, towards the Chinese embrace. But of course, it's not in our hands. And what Putin has done by strengthening ties with Russia, by alienating the Europeans, and by picking on the by by breaking the possibilities for a even a limited predictable relationship with the United States has put himself at, at great uh, difficulty, I think. And Russia is going to come out of it a diminished power, even if it uh, seizes uh, eastern eastern Ukraine. And that I think eventually, my sense is India, uh, India's own romance with Russia in some senses will begin to diminish 
uh, because Russia itself is going to is going to is going to diminish. Here, a word about why Russia is has such strong empathy in India. I mean, I think this goes back deep to the uh, the rise of Indian nationalism in the interwar period. Uh, that was also the period when the Soviet Union was founded. Uh, socialist ideas were uh, had gained enormous currency in India, and Russia was seen as a natural partner in building a new anti-colonial, post-colonial world. Uh, uh, and uh, the partition of the subcontinent and uh, the Western alliance with Pakistan uh, put us in a situation where we turn to Russia for balancing. And therefore, when you have the Indian political class, uh, which says, look, Russia has been a reliable partner. Now, in fact, a lot of the problem today, while the professionals might in the foreign office might say, look, uh, Russia has made a big mistake. We should not be with Russia at this point of time. We should find ways of distancing ourselves from Russia. But the political class largely sees uh, that there is a, a some kind of a, a historic obligation that Russia has stood by us uh, in difficult times. Now, uh, that you can quarrel with that proposition, but I'm telling you uh, that is a, a real deep proposition within the political class. And you would have thought the BJP, uh, a nationalist, a right-wing party, the successor of Jansang uh, in the 50s, 60s. The Jansang, or the predecessor of BJP, was the biggest opponent of India, Indira Gandhi's pro-Soviet foreign policy. So they were the biggest critiques of, of the policy that, that uh, you know, privileged so much of the Russian relationship. But uh, today, I mean, they, they political leaders as well, uh, believe the same proposition that Russia was, Russia was good to us, therefore we should not abandon uh, our friends in, uh, friends in Russia. But, but as I said, the Russian salience is beginning to decline since the end of the Cold War for India. And the, the change in India's economic orientation since then has seen a dramatic expansion of India's economic orientation, which is today much closer to the West. Uh, just to say, in India's trade figures, uh, this year, India's total trade will be about $1.4 trillion. Uh, India's trade with the US is about $160 billion. With EU, it's another $100 uh, with, uh, with uh, Britain and the Anglo-Saxon Anglo powers, if you will, would come to another hundred. So the, if you see the, the substantive orientation of the Indian economy today uh, is, uh, is, with the, is, is growing with the West and Indian diaspora, India's engagement at, uh, across the board uh, is, is getting deeper, wider uh, with, with Europe. But Russia does have uh, a, a significant uh, equities in India and, and the two of them, uh, one, uh, the question of uh, defense uh, relationship, uh, which we mentioned, uh, and the, the long-term balance of power uh, in, uh, in Asia, where Russia must play, uh, Russia hopefully, for our, from our perspective at least, uh, Russia has a, has a role. Uh, you'll recall that uh, Abesan of Japan uh, tried much the same. I mean, spent much of his uh, tenure rule uh, when he came back of trying to normalize the relationship with Russia, uh, hoping that they can do a boundary deal because Abesan was really the one who invented the idea of Indo-Pacific in a modern sense, was eager to draw Russia away from China. And India's own idea of uh, Russia uh, was, was similar. But unfortunately for both Japan and us, uh, we have been unsuccessful and what Russia has done uh, will have uh, consequences uh, which we have to deal with irrespective of our uh, preferences. Now, the, the question for us, as I said, as uh, let me reinforce uh, this point which uh, Frederick made about, for India, the principal challenge remains China. That brings me to the second uh, major power that, that uh, I want to talk about. Uh, for us, I mean, I would even say uh, it is India's karma now to balance China. Uh, whether the US is with us, whether the US is with China, or Europe is with China or not with China. For us, the fundamental problem today of the extraordinary power gap that has emerged between India and, uh, and Russia, India and China in the last 20 years is on, on uh, across the board in China's GDP today is about uh, uh, five times larger than India's. Uh, China's defense spending uh, is four times larger than India's. Uh, so the scale of the, of the power is, is widened from being roughly equal uh, in, the, in the mid 1980s. And this is not going to disappear, even if India does phenomenally well and China does poorly in the coming decades, that we can reduce the gap, but the gap is going to be a pretty large and significant. And it's a gap, not the concern, not just for India, 
Uh, because China, when many in India, my colleagues and in Asia talk about Asia's rise of uh, East versus the West, uh, much of that uh, glosses over the deep internal fault lines in Asia. And China's rise has only sharpened the deep internal fault lines uh, because China believes it's so much bigger than its Asian neighbors, the largest two of them, which is Japan and India, that it has, has the freedom of action to do what it wants vis-a-vis -vis China and vis-a-vis -vis Japan and India, and that it need not really be sensitive to, uh, India's, uh, to India's concerns or Japanese concerns. And that's the reason why India has turned uh, in a in a in a big way to the big way to the United States in the last few years, and before that, as, or let me just say, the four levels of challenge we have from China. One is the uh, territorial security. Uh, beside, you know, where actually we are in a, since we've been having regular conflicts, 2013, 2014, 2017, 2020, uh, and uh, this tension uh, is unlikely to disappear even if we resolve the current crisis, uh, because. Uh, the Chinese military now has learned to operate, is capable of operating close to the border, uh, and therefore uh, they see uh, they have a right to redeem uh, their claims. So we're going to have this problem for a long time. On the economic front, again, the rise of China, uh, India's turn to globalization in the 90s, has had one dramatic negative consequence, uh, which is the, uh, the cheap Chinese imports have largely hollowed out uh, India's uh, you know, domestic manufacturing capabilities, and that's the reason why India walked out of the of the RCEP, uh, the Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership Agreement, uh, and uh, it is looking now to do trade deals with its partners in the West, uh, so that we're not going to be tied to a China-led Asian economic order, but India would uh, try and selectively trade, uh, you know, develop deeper partnerships uh, with its strategic friends. Uh, we've seen that uh, with Australia in the last few weeks, uh, with the uh, UAE. Uh, with the UK, hopefully things are going to move in the next few weeks and months. And then Europe finally uh, and, you know, is agreed to resume trade talks uh, with India. So I think this is a, a conscious strategy uh, to distance from China on the, on the long-term economic cooperation and align with strategic partners uh, in the West. Uh, within the regional balance, uh, I would say uh, that, uh, that the Chinese power, uh, its radiation into the subcontinent and the Indian Ocean, today has compelled India uh, to look to other means besides its own capability to balance. India is now uh, turning to the, uh, to, the, to the United States, to Japan, to the export partners and France uh, in the Western Indian Ocean uh, to shore up the, uh, the regional uh, security. And finally, on the, on the global side, we have the Chinese blocking India's membership of the Nuclear Supplies Group, uh, opposing India's entry into the UN Security Council as a permanent member. So if you look at all the levels, uh, territorial dispute, uh, national defense, economic, regional balance of power, and the global uh, aspirations of India, uh, we are drawn, uh, we are at odds with, with China, and these structural contradictions are unlikely to, to disappear anytime soon. So this has made it uh, even more important for India to build a partnership with the West. And the US uh, principally, uh, which has been uh, for about 20 odd years, uh, which has seen India's potential as a balancer in Asia and has moved uh, decisively, I think, uh, from away from its past policies in South Asia uh, to, an, uh, to a policy that uh, focuses on deepening partnership with, with India. Uh, and both at the level of the bilateral relationship uh, with the security ties, um, plurilateral relationships like the Quad and on cooperation on, on global issues. So I would say uh, India has never been as close to the United States as it is today, because historically uh, India's foreign policy uh, was defined as something uh, we must keep distance from the United States. Uh, that was a legacy of, you can call it the legacy of Asianism, legacy of anti-colonial uh, struggles against the Western imperialism in, in Asia, uh, whichever you frame it, the principal uh, defining element of India's foreign policy until uh, the turn of the millennium uh, was one of keeping distance from the US. But today, uh, it is today drawn, the, it's today the US relationship uh, is one of the closest. It's also been the fastest improving India's relationship uh, among all its uh, major power relations. Having said that, uh, I must also uh, make it clear, India is not an alliance partner of the United States. India is not an ally in the way that most of you in Europe are, 
or Germany and, uh, or Japan and South Korea are or Australia is uh, in our region. So India is not. So I think many of you who expect India to simply behave like another ally, uh, I think will be mistaken. The fact that India is close to the US, is willing to collaborate with the US, uh, is collaborating with the US, but it is not an alliance partner that would simply always counted uh, to be in the uh, in the flank whenever uh, behind you uh, whenever you do it and underlying this is the fact that the us and india are trying to build a unique relationship a so generous relationship that would develop its own terms uh, for long term uh, strategic partnership rather than the kind of alliances that we have seen uh, us alliances that we have seen uh, in in europe and asia so i think uh, this is uh, this is a and uh, I must say, to the credit of the United States, uh, they've been extremely patient, uh, extremely consistent uh, across four administrations, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, uh, and uh, Joe Biden. All of them have consistently sought to expand the relationship with India. And I think, as you know, India is not an easy partner, uh, but really the US has shown the determination not to let this relationship slip. Uh, you've been, if you've been reading newspapers in the last few weeks, uh, it seemed to suggest that Ukraine was going to break up the quad, the quad is gone, Indo-Pacific is finished, and that India uh, is really a, 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 a black sheep uh, in the quad. But last week's uh, the two plus two dialogue between Delhi and Washington has shown the continuing depth and the commitment on the both sides to manage the problem of Ukraine while deepening their ties uh, with, uh, with, uh, with each other uh, across the board. And I think underlying this uh, is really the principal question that, that, that the crisis in Europe does not take away the long-term strategic challenge in Asia. And I think that is a, is a principal proposition, I think, that the US is not willing to forget whatever the scale of the challenge of Russia and Europe is, that China is there in the long-term uh, threat in, in, in Asia, and India is absolutely uh, indispensable in constructing uh, any such coalition uh, to deal with a, a, a new balance of power uh, in, uh, in, in Asia. Let me then, as I, as I come to the end of the presentation, I, mean, I think let me also say there is the Ukraine crisis uh, could also be an opportunity. Uh, for, for, for India and for the West, uh, West as a whole, uh, because for us, uh, the, the diminution of Russia's role, which is going to come out of it, and the compulsions of Putin's irresponsible actions in Ukraine or unprovoked aggression in Ukraine, willy-nilly will compel India to, to adapt, to adjust, and uh, rework its position. Uh, Indians are sentimental about Russia, but we are not suicidal. I mean, that uh, the, the structural, uh, you know, outcomes of this conflict are understood in Delhi, and that India's own position on Ukraine has evolved in the last uh, few weeks, I would say, at least more obliquely criticizing uh, the, the Russian intervention by reference to UN Charter, etc. Uh, it's also, I think, uh, a, 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 within the constraints that the Russia relationship poses, uh, that I think India is going to find ways to adapt and, and move forward. Uh, for example, on the weapons question, uh, with Russia itself in trouble, uh, the question of spares, the question of supplies in the coming years and months would be would be difficult. And uh, India has already initiated a whole strategy of uh, building more defense uh, capabilities at home. That is defense production at in, you know within India, and this I think will be a big big opportunity uh, for the weapons producers in the U.S. Uh, and in Europe. Uh, in fact, our defense minister in Washington the other day was making the pitch. Uh, India has changed the rules of uh, investment in defense companies. Indian private capital, uh, pro foreign private capital are both welcome in strengthening India's defense industrial base. So this, I think, uh, creates an opportunity for the West, uh, for France in particular, and, and I know every European country produces some interesting uh, thing or the other, especially in strategic side. So I think there might be a big opportunity here uh, to begin the process of uh, working with India to reduce India's dependence over the long term uh, on the Russian weapons. This would also mean, uh, my sense is, uh, that uh, India and the West uh, can do more uh, on uh, regional security, uh, on uh, uh, of, of developing, I would say, I mean, I would say like uh, Europe will be tied to the Ukraine security, depending on how long Russia is going to do this. Uh, but I think uh, a, a better sense of 
uh, burden sharing, that both of us helping each other in terms of dealing with our respective threats uh, can be negotiated uh, if, you are, if you are serious of, by using this crisis at this point of the time uh, to, to explore uh, those, those possibilities for assisting each other uh, in, the, in the days ahead. I know very well that uh, the disappointment is real, uh, in, but the Europe must also understand that India is, is committed to making a transition. I mean, it has already been involved in a transition of changing its relationships with the US, with Europe, uh, with America's allies in Asia, that is Japan and, uh, and, and Australia. And over the 20 year period in an incremental slow fashion, there is a dramatic change in India's economic orientation. Uh, there is also an expansion of the strategic involvement of the West in India's defense policies, but so not enough. Uh, that's a place where uh, we need to do more, both on the security issues, uh, as well as on uh, regional cooperation to deal with the, with the uh, uh, larger challenges in the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. So I'll conclude with the fact, again, under, under, underlining that the scale of the European crisis today is clearly an inflection point uh, in Europe, but that does not take away the challenges in Asia where India will remain uh, an important actor. And, and I think we need to find ways where we can uh, prevent a complete uh, you know, loss of Russian, European interest in the Indo-Pacific and to find ways in which uh, we can work with each other and help, help each other uh, in dealing with the larger security challenges in both the regions. So Frederick, I'll stop here. Thank you very much, Raja, for a very comprehensive uh, analysis of the problem, which raised a number of questions, of course, but we will come to it in a minute. Before we start the debate or the discussion, let me remind you that you can ask your question either through a chat box or through the Q&A box. Some of you have already done it, but there won't be any direct call to the speaker and relay your question to him. And I'd like to start with a question by Christoph Zalewski in, uh, in Warsaw. Uh, why Soviet Union equals Russia from the Indian perspective? The empire was much greater and Ukraine is the second biggest successor to the state. Even today, Indian vessels built by Russian companies have Ukrainian engines. So why India does not have a broader understanding of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc? And there is a second question. We were very glad in Poland to be able to help in evacuation of the Indian nationals from Ukraine. We see a rise of the geopolitical importance of Central and Eastern Europe in this crisis. Isn't it a great time to deepen India CE cooperation? Why isn't Warsaw, Prague, or Bucharest on the PM Modi visit in Europe next month? I think uh, both, are, both are good questions. Uh, it's really uh, a, the, it's quite, uh, why does India think of Soviet Union as, uh, as, uh, as the, Russia as the successor to the Soviet state? In fact, right now, uh, we have a huge dependence on a number of, for example, on the helicopter engines come out of Ukraine. We have uh, most of the turbine engines for ships and naval craft coming from Ukraine. So I think there is, at least in the defense industrial sector, uh, there is an awareness. But at the broad political level, I think, uh, it's unfortunate, but a historic uh, tragedy, if you will, that India has seen much of Europe through Russian eyes, thanks to the Cold War. Uh, and we've not really broken away from that uh, basic uh, structural thinking, not only uh, within Russia, within the Soviet, uh, Soviet Union, but also in terms of Eastern Europe. India, as a close partner of the Soviet Union, had privileged access uh, to uh, Eastern Europe because most of the East European countries uh, engaged with India uh, during the Cold War. But unfortunately, uh, after, the, after the end of the Cold War and the uh, dissolution of the Warsaw Pact and the breakup of the Soviet Union, India's own priorities were so focused on US, Russia, US China uh, uh, and uh, the regional issues in, uh, in South Asia that it did not pay much attention to Europe's geopolitics. And I think what we've seen in the last couple of years at least our Minister Jay Shankar, and I think has devoted uh, significant attention to, uh, to Europe. Uh, he's met uh, in different parts, including the Visegrad Four, the Baltic, uh, the Baltic countries, the, the Nordics. Uh, so, so my sense is there is a growing awareness that the 
that Europe is not a monolith, it's not just EU, that there is huge sense of uh, internal issues there. And for us, we need to be better aware of European geopolitics and of even European institutions. Everyone tells us, look, we don't understand the EU, maybe right. But even more broadly, uh, we've lost a sense of European geopolitics because for long, we saw it as a neat east-west uh, divide. Uh, for example, I mean, I've been writing a lot on uh, uh, the Germany's reaction and the and the politics of Germany in dealing with uh, in Ukraine crisis. I've written about Poland, but for many Indians, this is really uh, not something they pay attention to. So, so my my strong recommendation to our European friends uh, is to engage with India on these questions. And there is a receptive year, and my sense is uh, our Prime Minister is coming to Europe again. Uh, I think we need to understand the complexities of uh, European history and its geopolitics, which we have simply the Cold War certitudes, the Cold War black and white uh, propositions have really uh, undermined our understanding of, uh, of, uh, of uh, European geopolitics. Second, I would say uh, there's been not enough political engagement with the Indian political class uh, from the European political class. Uh, that while there is expanding G to G, government to government engagement, the political side, uh, I think we need to do a lot more uh, for Europeans to speak up and engage with uh, with the with the Indian civil society uh, and with the with the Indian uh, Indian political class because many Indians don't understand or see why does Sweden feel so afraid of Russia why does the Baltic countries are afraid of Russia why is uh, Poland uh, so uh, you know the the, the history of uh, Poland's troubles with, with Russia. I, I think there is not enough awareness and European history used to be taught in India to the liberal education uh, before independence. It's, it's no longer taught. So, so I think we have a problem there and I think that needs to be addressed uh, seriously. But on the policy side, uh, there is today in Delhi a much greater interest in Europe. And my sense is as Prime Minister Modi comes to Europe, they would be, uh, I think, trying to strengthen these ties and give it a more a depth uh, both in, in uh, economic and, and in geopolitical terms. I mean, I would certainly say the Visegrad 4, I know we have a bit of problem there, Visegrad 3, if you will, uh, that, that we need to do a lot more with, with Central Europe. Because in the last few years, uh, uh, we've done more with France uh, uh, and Germany, but not enough in Central Europe. Uh, my sense is uh, that is, again, need to be a very high priority for India in the coming years. And I think I'm, I'm quite confident it, it will be in the coming years. Thank you, Raja. We have another question related this time with, to, uh, to the relationship between India and China. Much of the rationale for India abstaining on Ukraine is based on security and the failure to diversify its arms supply. But if push comes to shove in the Himalayas with China, why does India think it will be able to depend on Russia continuing to supply arms? Will Russia depend on China not make that unlikely? And this is a question from Joseph Johnson. My sense is that this is a good question. And I think we are transcending that question. Um, because if you remember the 2020 crisis when China surprised us on the Ladakh border, uh, the only place our minister, defense minister went was to Moscow to make sure that the Russian pipeline would not, would not close. Uh, and the Russians did supply. I mean, I think the Russians still trying to maintain some engagement with India uh, that they needed so, so at least till now, till the Ukraine crisis, uh, the idea that Russia would, would be a partner at a reasonable basis. But now where, what Russia is going to come out of this, uh, Russia's own industry, its own uh, complications as they get stronger, the, the, the poor uh, quality of its weapons that has been displayed. I think Indians are doing much better with Russian weapons than Russian seems to be. Uh, and the question of how much of an industrial production the Russians will do in the coming years, all that are going to compel uh, India to move. Uh, and my sense is the emphasis on self-reliance and defense production uh, and, the, and the invitation to domestic and foreign capital uh, to produce weapons in India. And I think it's a beginning uh, and it's not going to happen overnight. But I think if we seize this opportunity, uh, we will see uh, India reduce its uh, dependence on Russia in the coming years. And I think if you saw uh, what uh, Blinken said when he was meeting Jay Shankar last week, he said, look, in, the US could not supply weapons to India during the Cold War, but whatever reasons, I mean, the India-Pakistan issues and others. But today, the US is saying, uh, we're willing to help India uh, to further diversify its uh, defense supplies. Uh, 
we're already scouring the uh, the East European markets for weapons and spare parts. So I think the U.S. sees the issue uh, as a as the, the the path forward is to reduce India's dependence on Russia. And for that, can we do more defense cooperation? Can we do more defense industrial cooperation? Uh, which I think. Uh, will produce, and I think here France has engaged with India quite seriously. And if India produces, uh, provides uh, the right policy environment for foreign defense investment uh, into India, I hope uh, that that would create a situation where we're going to see a, a lot more defense industrial cooperation between India, US, and India and Europe as well. Can we, can we uh, rebond on that question to elaborate a little bit on the role Russia plays in India's China equation? You've been focusing mostly on the arms dependency and so on. Could you, could you tell us a little bit on the political relationship, what, what Russia does in relation with China to help uh, India? And are we are we not, or are we seeing a sort of a diminution diminishing re return on India's investment in Russia when it comes to this triangular relation between India, China, and Russia? I think certainly after Ukraine, uh, that is going to be the case. Uh, in fact, uh, ever since Gorbachev, I mean, I still recall Gorbachev's visit to Delhi, uh, India's concerns that uh, Russia was going to make up with uh, with China. Uh, and that those concerns have significantly multiplied over the years. The closer Russia gets to China, the harder it will be uh, for the Indians to see Russia as a, as a reliable partner. But don't forget that the India-Russia partnership was built uh, when Sino-Russian relationship uh, was down in the dumps. Uh, too often, uh, Russia is seen as a issue between India and the West. Uh, but if you go to the our history of the triangular dynamic between India, Russia, China, uh, Russia was also a critical player in balancing China uh, for India. Uh, because the West and China were getting together, uh, then it was only Ru Russia that was with us uh, in, uh, in balancing China until the 1980s when the Russians tried to normalize a uh, relationship with China. And since then, uh, the relationship has become much stronger. Uh, India's economic ties with China are much bigger than India's ties with uh, with Russia. So I think the 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 general decline of Russia's weight. Uh, the problem for us is that narrow niche dependence that we have, and if we can find ways to reduce that, uh, my my sense is uh, we will begin to uh, go away from that, and and that we can uh, 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 both structurally, I think, uh, the the dynamic that is unfolding uh, is going to reduce uh, Russia's. Uh, uh, favorability for India. I'll just give you the example of Afghanistan, uh, when the Russians were deeply collaborating with Pakistan and, uh, and China uh, in dealing with Afghanistan, much to the, much to the dismay in, uh, in Delhi. Uh, similarly, uh, on, uh, we hear that it is really the, the Chinese are really trying to draw Pakistan closer to Russia, and the Russians too were occasionally would play the Pakistan card. Uh, so even the regional dynamic, my sense is, over the coming years uh, would make it more and more imperative for India uh, to diversify away from Russia and to build stronger ties uh, with the West uh, in, the, in the coming years. We do have a question from Jean-Luc Racine in Paris. After India's abstention vote at UNSC, Sashitao commented, it does not reflect well when a country like India was fired for UN Security Council seat goes completely silent on international recognized principle. Raja, do you share this view, or should we rather consider that on the one end, as you remind us, China is not open to India's access to UNSC as a permanent member, and on the other end, the comments from Quad member and the India-US 2 plus 2 meeting do testify that the relationship with the West remains on track. You have partly yeah. answered that question when it comes to remaining on track or not, but... Uh, well, what about the first part of the question? Shashi, Shashi Tarur was uh, quite right, I think. Uh, he's probably the only <laughs> politician who's really, uh, you know, publicly criticized the, in, in a very stark terms, the India's position. But if you also look at India's parliamentary debate on Ukraine, mm -hmm. uh, there was a, a lot of unhappiness uh, with the way Russia has handled this. So it is not that uh, uh, everyone is simply rooting for Russia. It is really a... a, a a, a difficult situation that India finds itself in rather than India's silence or India's uh, abstentions are not in any way endorsement of the of the of the Russian actions and that's even the UN votes the explanation of what 
the adjustments that have been made. I think many people have said, look, India could have used the word aggression. Uh, India could have voted at least on the procedural issues uh, with the with the uh, with the rest of the com international community, but for whatever reasons it has chosen uh, not to do. But I think there is at least uh, on the bright side, the U.S. seems to understand India's predicaments, and the emphasis, at least in Washington, uh, is to make it easier, make it more attractive for India uh, to to move away from Russia uh, quickly and 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 uh, as as quickly uh, as possible. The second second part of the question, Frederick, you want to uh, remind me that? No, no. The, the question the question was about the, the comments from Quad mem members and in the India US two plus two meetings do testify that the relationship with the West remains on track. Um, well, I think yeah, you, you have the in a, in a month uh, we're going to have the Quad summit. Uh, right. We had the uh, the virtual summit between Modi and Biden uh, uh, a week ago. Uh, when the two plus two dialogue took place. So I don't see any let up in the India, US, India quad relationship uh, that will continue. Again, I think this is what one of the central points we made in this talk. The Asian question does not disappear because we have a deep crisis in Europe. Uh, I think the Americans see that point and, and, and I think there India uh, is critical. So, so the, my sense is uh, at least there's some understanding that they would have all preferred India to be, would have been far more vocal on the, on the Russian aggression, uh, but they also see uh, the India's uh, position as a critical position in the uh, balance of power in, uh, in, in Asia. Thank you, Aja. We do have a question by Alicia Garcia Herrero, and uh, uh, I think this is a, a comment as well as a question which very much reflects the, uh, uh, the reaction of many Europeans. He says, I'm very surprised by this talk. It would seem as if India is still stuck with a view of the Cold War, it so happens that the EU has been there for many decades. Has India missed that story? The EU is a very large investor in India, much more than Russia or even China. The same is true for trade as a region. This does not really show in India's recent action. As for the India-Russia reliable partnership, what about Pakistan-Russia amicable relation, to say the least, and Pakistan membership in the Shanghai Cooperation Agreement, does India not worry of falling in between two camps? As I said, look, as long as the Asian question remains, so we're not falling off the stools. So we, are, we are very much closer to the West, uh, to the US, uh, on the Asian balance of power. Uh, we've seen uh, uh, India, you know, India, Europe as an economic actor. I mean, there is no, for a long time, in India had trouble engaging with that. But in the last of the two years, we've seen India now a step up engagement with the EU as a collective uh, and the, uh, the, the, the summit uh, last year and the beginning of the negotiations on the free trade agreement uh, are important steps forward. And individually on the defense cooperation with France, uh, what we've done since uh, Macron came uh, since from 2018, I mean, a fairly significant number of steps have been taken with, uh, with France. Uh, so India sees actually, uh, in fact, Europe as a, as a potential partner that can reduce the variabilities that might come in the US-China relationship. So, so I, I don't think India is underestimating, uh, India is late to engaging Europe. But Europe, let's also be clear, Europe is still not a strategic actor. I mean, I think uh, it's also a fact that, that uh, Europe has, still has problems. I mean, your debates on Ukraine itself uh, will tell you uh, quite a bit of those, uh, whether it is the question of the European strategic autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the US, whether it is NATO or EU, whether it is the German engagement with Russia on trade uh, or uh, drawing a line by the East European, Central Europeans want. I think there are issues. It's not as if all these issues have been settled in Europe, uh, that Europe itself is struggling to come to terms with this. Uh, but for India, I think a stronger Europe uh, would be very welcome for India. A Europe that acts as a strategic entity would make it easier for us uh, to, to, to build a, a, an order that is a global order that is far more consequential. As for the Russia-China thing, I mean, of course, as mentioned in my earlier question, uh, they are occasionally play this card, but uh, there is a fascinating, you can say, a comparison between Russia and China. Both have nuclear, Russia and Pakistan, both have nuclear weapons and not much else. Uh, so I don't think uh, it has a lot of political thing. I think a lot of it is being driven by, by China. Uh, so we are, Delhi is fully conscious of that, uh, of that fact. And uh, uh, we see that, and, and I think that's also one reason why 
uh, India wants to strengthen ties with the with the US and the Quad. I mean, if you see a relentless criticism by Lavrov of India's Indo-Pacific strategy, but India has not India has not walked away from that. India is actually doubling down uh, on its commitment to the Indo-Pacific and the partnership with the US, Japan, and uh, and uh, and Australia. And India is also going to be, we'll have Boris Johnson here this week, uh, setting up a free trade agreement with Britain, a uh, strengthening defense partnership with Britain uh, that is going on. So, so Europe is by no means uh, uh, today uh, out of India's focus. And my sense is uh, there are no, you know, for us, uh, as I said, look on economic, on defense and people to people on diasporic links everywhere. The West is a much bigger actor uh, in India's world today. And Russia is one that is its weight will continue to decline in the way India, uh, India's own, uh, you know, uh, international relations. Can we stay for a minute on this Russia-Pakistan relation? Not so much because of its real value, but because there seems to be some signaling on the part of Russia that, well, you know, uh, Moscow has some options there as well. But it relates to the nuisance capability of Russia if uh, if India didn't did choose to actually confront Moscow on a number of issues. Is that something you take seriously, or is that mere uh, signaling and nothing else? I think so far it's been signaling, uh, but uh, you saw uh, Imran Khan's visit to Russia. I mean, the Russian Foreign Office for a long time. Sorry, the French and the sorry the Russians and the Pakistanis for a long time of trying to find a way. I think uh, the Russians uh, played them to get Imran Khan into Moscow on the day of the invasion, uh, and I believe the Chinese have had uh, some role to it. Uh, but you saw the army chief in Bajwa make a correction. I mean, uh, two weeks you know later uh, last week, a uh, week before, uh, where he said, "Look, uh, Russian invasion is wrong. Uh, the U.S. has Pakistan's real long-term interests are with the U.S. and with Europe." two main trading partners, therefore the Pakistan needs to reset. Uh, that brings me to the Pakistan's domestic politics, where Imran Khan uh, is mobilizing anti-Americanism, anti-Westernism. The army still wants to, uh, you know, reset to a relationship that 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 restores its close relationship with the, with the West. But that's where their complication with China comes in, which is as long as US and China were on the same side, Pakistan had it going very, very well. Uh, they had good relationships with both. Uh, but today, as US and China and they get into uh, a, a conflictual mode uh, for Pakistan, uh, is going to be quite a hard navigating to do uh, in between those. But I would conclude by saying, focus more attention to China and China's attempt at constructing a regional coalition of non-Western countries. Uh, there was a time when India would have been a part of it. But today, I think uh, India, if as long as India sees uh, China has its principal threat, uh, we've heard the slogans before, Asia for Asians, uh, Asian unity. And we, that's what we had. Uh, Wang Yi, Chinese foreign minister, coming to Delhi the other day, talking about, let's get be our Asian brothers, let's sit and you know rebuild a non-Western order. Uh, I don't think Delhi is buying that line. We're going to still sit in brick and bricks and all that stuff. Uh, but I think, uh, I think we are enough inoculated against uh, that kind of a romanticism uh, uh, about Russia. So I would worry less about Russia in that sense. It is China that is really driving the process uh, in, uh, in Pakistan and the region. Talking of the ad of romanticism on the Russia-India relationship, uh, can we reverse the, relation, the, the dependency relationship and look at the potential leverage that India may have? Do you see, for example, the fact that India is the largest uh, export market for Russia's uh, arm uh, industry as a leverage on Moscow? And if so, how does it materialize? Look, we could have done this before. I mean, uh, in the last 30 years, as India was a major market, Russia was down in the dumps in the 90s. Uh, mm -hmm. They desperately needed Indian contracts to survive. And I think uh, we, we missed the trick uh, through the 1990s. Uh, and in the name of uh, a multipolar world, we kept keeping the Russian option alive. And, and cumulatively, uh, that has turned out to be a serious problem. But today, I think the strategy and the policy is to is to break away from that. I mean, that uh, that if Russian market itself is going to be in a bad shape, uh, that there is no leverage left thanks to the Ukraine war. And the Indian focus now would be uh, domestic production uh, and see if we can get the Western capital and Western uh, high-tech and uh, defense companies uh, to come into that. 
one thing which you you partly elaborated on uh, uh, previously in your presentation is the path to get away from the dependency vis-a-vis -vis Russia. I mean, you've mentioned the development of the India framework and the need to uh, indigenously build up your uh, arms industry. I mean, this is not something really new in India. This has some. This is something which has been difficult in the past, to say the least. What makes you optimistic about the prospect of this becoming the way of getting away from uh, from Russia in the future? Because in the past, I mean, our focus was really on so-called domestic production was really again with the Russians. I mean, that there was uh, very little effort. I mean, I'm not going to the 50s or 60s, but since the 60s make 21 deal, uh, it has just been Russia, Russia, Russia all the time. And we kept buying uh, <coughs> weapon systems uh, with deals with France and the US and Israel, uh, but there were no really attempt at producing it at home. But today there is an industrial policy that has been announced, uh, which specifically bars a large number of items from being imported. Uh, it's liberalized the foreign investment uh, and private investment uh, in defense production. So that those are clear new policies that have been unveiled. And how much of traction it will get, that remains to be seen, that there is a new policy in place. And Prime Minister Modi's strong commitment to, uh, uh, you know, of, of reducing imports, uh, of producing more at home, and, uh, and, and, and an openness to the Western investment to, to produce. So we, we don't have yet a, a, a really a big deal whether it's Rafal or someone else comes and says that, look, uh, here we are, be ready to produce this and the conditions are ripe. Uh, one such deal, I think, uh, would, uh, would be needed to demonstrate uh, what the question, the skepticism uh, behind your question. But the policies have been put in place. Now the question is to see if there is at least one major deal of defense production uh, in India, uh, not just for Indian armed services, but also for the, uh, for the regional markets. No, I was not so much expressing uh skepticism than observing a reality. In fact, there are several dimensions into this. This is uh, not just India's capacity, there is also the willingness to transfer the technology on precisely systems which are biased and uh, uh, falls under the, the, the sovereign categories and so on. So this is a political difficulty that cannot be ignored and will be a limitation in any case. So what makes you think that this time this is going to be, uh, or this could be successful, and where is it likely to be more successful? Because we have seen also a change of attitude of Russia vis-a-vis -vis China, from a situation where it did deliver no weapons to China, to one where it did deliver the same level of weapons to China and India, but with different level of technologies, to one now where it does deliver to both of them the same technology, which seems to be problematic in a number of cases. And therefore there is something which is all urgent and countries in the West are ready to cooperate on some system, not on others. And this is gonna be a dilemma that will remain for some time. So uh, how do you see this evolution, which admittedly is not an easy win, uh, but, but is there, is there reality in the, the setting up of the process. No, no, absolutely. Look, I think the post-Ukraine situation, I mean, I think it's going to be harder and harder if this war and the crisis last longer. Uh, India might have stored up uh, some reserves of Russian spares and uh, systems, but after some time, that's going to get uh, into serious trouble. So, so we will be forced to do things that will uh, deal with the new reality. Uh, it's only when you face a situation like this, uh, when you're compelled to uh, act decisively. But in the last three years, uh, the emphasis on defense production and defense production at home, for example, the Indian private sector today is participating more actively. If you remember in the past, the MOD, the Ministry of Defense, never really let the Indian private sector uh, develop the capabilities for weapons production. But what we've seen in the last few years, the Tatas, uh, the uh, Los and Tobro, and we're beginning to see even small electronic companies are beginning to do things and contributing to uh, defense production. And then you have actually a B2B, that is business to business deals, and we're beginning to see some co production, uh, not in the old G2G negotiated ones like between India and, uh, and the Russians, but for example, Lockheed and Tata's uh, have an agreement on the production of some spares, uh, even the French companies. Uh, the C-925, I think, uh, the uh, transport aircraft uh, that is going to be produced in partnership with Tata. So I think we're beginning to see 
a co-production uh, on on some some uh, major agreements but what we need is a a, a, a significant uh, big bang uh, deal that that would make that a reality and second uh, is also the the fact that india is also uh, corporatized uh, the the ordnance factories india's ordnance factories are the oldest in the world uh, and after being prolonged badly functioning state uh, state owned state owned enterprises now they're being moved uh, into uh, corporations uh, to for, to make them more efficient so i think a number of steps have been taken to bring in private capital because there's no other way for india uh, to deal with uh, the massive requirements uh, of its defense and here the preferred partner uh, would be uh, would be would be the united states uh, and the west and in between a number of contracts are being cancelled in fact last week uh, the helicopter contract with russia was cancelled so my sense is uh, both for uh, the given the real conditions that present themselves as well as the the need i think the pre announced policies like self-reliance are coming together, I think, uh, finally to produce a, a, a new framework for India's uh, defense production. How far do you think this, the linking process with Russia can go? We have spoken so far of the defense, uh, the, the dependency and so on. What about the political process? You said in your presentation, for example, that you, the, India was not an ally of the United States and you explained why. But I mean, in the present situation, complete the linkage from, uh, from Russia would also mean falling somewhere in between two camps without having the guarantee of an alliance, but still the risk, if not more, of uh, the Chinese side and so on. How would you, would you manage this? Better relation with Europe is perhaps one dimension of it, but there might be others. That, and you might ultimately decide to keep some as good a relation as possible with Russia. How would you see that evolution? Look, I think a lot depends on what happens to, to Russia is Putin is there forever. I mean, I, as I said, look, this is what Macron, what is Macron saying? That Russia is a natural part of Europe. You need to engage them. You need to keep them on board. To that extent, uh, India will say, look, uh, we need Russia in Asia. But if Putin makes it harder and harder to actually uh, bet on that uh, as, as, a, as a serious proposition in the near term. And there's no choice. That doesn't leave you uh, any choice. But there will be someday a post-Putin Russia, I'm sure, uh, whether it's in the near term or the longer term. I mean, nobody is immortal. Uh, my sense is uh, that what happens then, uh, what the West itself, how it deals with Russia uh, was going to be, will be, will be interesting. So, so my sense is at this point, we are in the middle of a crisis in which Russia is deeply implicated its ability to service uh, the past contracts is going to be hard. Our ability to pay for the weapons, thanks to sanctions, is going to get harder. Uh, given those circumstances, the question is, how much does India invest to, uh, to make uh, more of the uh, a move quickly to the other side? But there, uh, I would say in terms of the political side, look, I think India is not going to be an ally. You know, look, I think we got to understand the difference between Europe uh, Europe needed a, a Europe that collapsed out of the Second World War, needed the United States to, to help it to build a, a, a new uh, order, new security situation in Europe. Uh, India is not, you know, India is going to do partnerships, but it is not going to be a, 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 a you know, an ally, either, even like the French who are in and out and uh, all the French positions on, you know, NATO command, not in it, someday in it. Uh, French talk about strategic autonomy. Uh, all that, I mean, for India, I think it would remain as, as India's relative weight in the international system grows. Uh, and it is going to need both the US, but in a, in a framework, and that's why I said it is going to be a so generous co uh, collaboration that is going to be built, not in a NATO-like structure, or not in a US-Japan alliance structure, because our interests, I think, US-India interests converge uh, in Asia. Uh, and that convergence, I think, uh, will last uh, for a reasonable amount of time. And, and within that framework, are uh, we going to build? But meanwhile, is India going to get stronger in the process? I think it will. Our problem with China is not going to disappear anytime soon. So I don't see falling between the two stools uh, at this point uh, uh, at all, even on the political side. We, we, yes, we will sit in the RIC, we'll sit in the BRICS, uh, in the SEO. Uh, if you look at these, none of these organizations, I mean, if you have the patience to read their declarations, uh, this like the, they become like the old non-aligned movement. I mean, that, that uh, whatever we might say publicly, our government might say about BRICS, 
Look, China is stronger than all the other four put together. Uh, so, so I think uh, it is, we'll see what happens in next month in the BRICS summit. So I don't think India today sees its future with the BRICS, the way it formulated the issue. Uh, Frederick, you are aware in the mid nineties, the multipolar world. I mean, you remember you, there was a man called Hubert Wedrine. Uh, I wish we had gone with France to build a multipolar world, but uh, we chose to go with the uh, go with the Russians and the Chinese uh, there. But but today the assumption that the West will be running away with Indian Kashmir, the West will take away India's nuclear weapons. Therefore, India needed a multipolar world in partnership with China and Russia. But today the great paradox history is cruel. Uh, we find that it is China that creates problems for us in Kashmir, the China that creates problems for us with uh, Pakistan. Uh, it is China that undermines India's influence in uh, uh, in South Asia. It is China that's rising presence in the Indian Ocean, undermines India's primacy, and China that blocks India in the multilateral institutions. And the answers to all these questions at this stage is with the US and the West. So therefore, I think that structural centrality, uh, I don't think anybody misses that. The question is, how do we navigate this? How much of it? We're not going to shut down the BRICS. We're going to sit there. But if BRICS is doing more or is Quad doing more, uh, that will tell you where the real uh, stuff is happening. Thank you very much, Raja. It was fascinating. But unfortunately, this session is coming to a close. I'd like to thank you very, very much. This was a tough session. Uh, I'd like to thank all uh, the audience for the question and, and being there and contributing to uh, the, the richness of the discussion. I'd like also to tell you that we will next month welcome uh, Darshan Abawa who will tell us about uh, China's policy in the uh, Indian Ocean. On that, I will close this session. Thank you again to all of you and see you next month.